Thousands of buildings are demolished. For some of them, especially those in built-up areas, only explosives will do the job. It's a high-octane, often dangerous world, and a world that has been entirely dominated by men until now. first woman explosives engineer, Holly Bennett. When you told your family you wanted to be an explosives engineer, what, what was their reaction? <laughs> I think they thought it were a bit of a phase because I was like 17, oh, I want to be an explosives engineer. And um, I think they thought it was one of those things that will pass, you know. When, when you see this tower block come down, you'll, you'll get the bug, because everybody generally does. Um, I saw one and I just thought, I'm in the ideal situation here. I couldn't be with a better company. I just saw him. we'll go for it. I never expected three years ago that this is what I'd be doing. Um, and now, I love my job. <laughs> Elgol Court is the latest in a long line of 60s tower blocks to be demolished. What makes this block special, however, is that for the first time in British demolition history, a woman is in charge of its collapse. Be really tight on that corner. I think they're going to be really worried, Dick, aren't they? Yeah. We've got to pull them away from both sets of houses, haven't we? We can't. There's no direction. Holly Bennett of Controlled Demolition is up on the roof inspecting the job with fellow engineers Mick and Dick, and things are looking tight. Only rooms down the bank, and I think we're going to have a problem then. Yeah, if we start tilting it back, it could yeah. go. slide into the houses, yeah. won't yeah. it? The bomb. It is definitely a challenge because it's such a tight job. I don't think I've ever worked on something as tight as this before. On the other side, the houses. Other sight, I think. We'll this one is going to have to come straight down because there's a, a big slope at the back, a substation at one side, and properties all the, covering the rest of the area. The guy in the house will have some concerns as well. I think she looks like a private <laughs> owner, doesn't he? I wouldn't be if I were in there, yeah. It being my first job, I guess uh, I'm a little bit emotional about it. Like I said, it is, it is quite a tight one, but we'll get there, definitely. Holly's problem is that Elgol Court is surrounded by residential buildings, the nearest of which is just six metres away. To cap it all, the tower sits on top of a hill, down which it cannot be allowed to fall. This 13-storey tower block contains at least 12,000 tonnes of concrete and brick. Before you can bring down a building of this size, you've got to understand how it was put up. Bob Johnson is a consultant structural engineer employed by controlled demolition to design what is called the collapse mechanism. On this occasion, there's nothing else we can do but take them straight down. So the delays will go off first on the gables, the ends of the building, and work their way in in three delay stages to the central core. And the central core, which is very stiff, that will remain there to the last. Uh, the building will collapse in round about it and then go straight down. Fire. When we do the survey of the building, one of the things that we're interested in is how the original intended strengths can be used against the building. It's almost like a judo match where you're using the, the strength, the momentum of the opponent to defeat him. So I think um, in Gravity We Trust is our, our logo in design. Once Bob has identified which walls to blast, Holly moves in with the men to prepare the load-bearing walls for the explosives. It'll take three weeks to complete and goes hand-in-hand hand with the removal of the non-load-bearing walls, which need to be taken out manually to facilitate the building's collapse. It's a dirty, noisy process. But the dirt and the noise are not the only things preying on the minds of the nearby residents. Susan Callahan lives with her six-year-old son in the house at the bottom of the hill. 
it's all very well them saying that it's safe and it's, they've done it a thousand times, but I, I actually asked a question whether they'd have it done if it was their house that was at the bottom of it. And of course they said, yeah, but that's what they're going to say, isn't it? I mean, if it's going to fall the other way, it'd have to snap in half, whereas all it has to do here is lean, and then my house is going to take the full force of it and get squashed. It's a week before blowdown and time to bring in the explosives for a test blast. It can be a bit eerie at times. You come, when you first come into one of the tower blocks, there's still everything there um, that were there when people lived in the building. And then you're coming in and putting explosives in their living room walls and their bedroom walls. And it's just a bit strange, really. The team have to establish the amount of explosives each load-bearing wall is going to need. It's a fine balance. Too little and the walls won't collapse. Too much and the explosion will rip through the protective wrapping which is designed to contain the blast. One metre lengths of 40 gram per metre detonating cord are plugged into the wall. And the building is evacuated. None of you guys have superstitions about women handling uh, high explosives? No. No. no they always handle just mine. Just <laughs> they always handle mine. There's never a problem. Yeah, I am. Standing down here. The explosives have taken the wall out nice and clean, which is just exactly what we wanted. Um, but the protection's ripped a tiny little bit on one of the joints where they've joined it together. Um, so we're just going to, well, put an extra wrap of it round and then it, there shouldn't be any problem with it at all. Other than that, this is perfect, what, exactly what we wanted. Oh, nine and a half for that one. <laughs> Never get a perfect mark. For, since it's the first one, we'll go for a 9.5. <laughs> You're too good to move me. The test blast may have been a success, but to reduce the whole building to rubble, the team have to decide how many floors to blast. A wrong decision on that score can lead to disaster. It's not only a matter of how many blast floors you actually introduce, it's where you introduce them into the building. Uh, there was a problem in a, a job in Hackney many years ago, which has become fairly famous within the industry now. It was planned as a symbolic big bang. For the first time, a tower block would be destroyed for purely social reasons. Uh, a company called Ellie Jones, who have since gone bust, or did because of the incident, but they had seven blast floors in a building not that much higher than this one. Uh, their problem is that they didn't fully understand, or their engineers didn't understand, the energy distribution you need. So they put all seven blast floors at the bottom of the block. It was, said the council, an explosion that would reverberate throughout millions of homes in Britain. Well, almost. And the thing that made it so famous is that they had suspended a banner. So as the building went down, the banner flapped up, and all you could see was the white back of the banner. But when the building stopped, and then very slowly came down as Ellie Jones, and it was a scream for everybody not involved, but uh, fairly tragic for the, those that were. To avoid a rerun of the Hackney disaster, Bob has decided to blast floors one, two, five, and nine. In total, 800 high explosive charges need to be placed. Most people that have never seen anything like this and have never come across any explosives, they're always a little bit surprised to see that this. Um, with it being so small and it doesn't look like anything particularly spectacular um, that it can do so much damage. Something of this size and can take out this wall so easily. I do know that accidents have happened with detonators going off too soon when people are charging and so on. Never happened to us but I have heard about cases um, where people have either been injured or killed by something as small as these detonators going off 
before they should. Once a plug of quick-drying cement has secured each of the 800 charges, the laborious task of bunching together the fuses begins. The challenge is for all the charges to be fired from one line. The yellow detonating cords, gathered in batches of 20, will themselves be initiated by a small explosive charge called a bunch connector. Well, arms, we've got about 11 or 12 of these connectors on each floor. They'll be put into different connectors we call UB0 connectors and all be brought back down to one line that was run out to the firing point at the end. It's like a big spider's web that's pulled in together. You've got to be very careful all the time to make sure that everything's in. You haven't missed anything. If we just missed one bunch connector here, what we could end up with is a quarter of the building not going all together, which we just we can't have. With 35 kilos of high explosive and a contract worth hundreds of thousands of pounds, we cannot be too cautious. Holly is being carefully supervised by Mick and Dick. It's only since Holly started with it that we started getting pink tubes. It's, it's a girly thing. I'm a bit of a worrier. Uh, I'm not beyond waking up at 3 o'clock in the morning and thinking, have we got enough explosives in? Have we got too much explosives in? Because at the end of the day, it is, it is a dangerous job and it is a worrying job. You're playing with explosives and you're playing with people's lives. It was billed as the biggest controlled explosion since the Second World War, two and a half tonnes of gelignite blowing up the 200 feet high tower blocks. But as dust and flying debris engulfed the gorbals, five people, including a policeman, were injured. One of them, a 61-year-old woman, died later in hospital. Lessons of the late 80s disaster in Glasgow have been well learned. Blast floors are now wrapped with protective sheeting to help contain the flying debris. Can't get up from downstairs. It's a tricky job, and these high winds are putting Holly's schedule at risk. It's one where Phil is, it wants undoing. Where Phil is. But not everyone is feeling the strain. Fat controller. <laughs> Too many chiefs in there. <laughs> This block's been a total nightmare with conditions. You know, it's, it's way situated. It's always been a high wind place and everything revolves round it, blows round it. Um, conditions have been really bad. We've never had a, a sunny day, nothing on here. Just been well hammered. With two days to go till blowdown, the protection is being shredded by the wind and working conditions are atrocious. Eventually, it gets so bad that foreman Big Dave Henshaw is forced to pull out his crew. We're getting netted up because we lost a day yesterday on protection and we're trying to pull it round and, like again, this isn't helping us. So we get a bit stressed out, but we'll get there. In Rochdale, Lancashire, controlled demolitions attempts to blow down the Elgol Court tower block are running into difficulty. They've got just 24 hours left, and the protective wrapping is in tatters. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Up on the roof, there are more pressing problems. Controlled demolition boss Charles Moran is coming to inspect the building later on in the day. Before he arrives, the team need to hang the company's publicity banner. Nightmare. Nightmare. I'm telling you, someone's going to end up getting killed here. Someone's going to end up going off the top here. No one seems to know what's going on. I don't know why they have these fucking banners on anyway. What a bollocks, man. Fucking yeah, we'll get, get some more bodies up there and make it safe up on top. In a last-ditch attempt to get the banner up before Moran's inspection, Foreman Dave sends in the cavalry. Sixteen men manage to secure ropes to the top and bottom of the banner. Then half of them go to the next floor down to catch the ropes as they're lowered over the parapet. For the men left on top, the winds are just too much. No chance. Leave it. Tight off. Smithy rang me up and said to me, "It's too dangerous. We're not up. Not. Uh, we're never going to get banners down." Mm. So I says, "I bought it and leave it." End of story. I'm not putting nobody at risk for it. The boss may not be best pleased, but Dave decides lives cannot be put at risk. And besides, there's more important matters. 
Pete's football score for you, Dave. Sorry, sorry about this. It's a famous football team at the end of this. What is it, Scouts? Yo, sorted. <laughs> See you later. 2-1. That's my team Wednesday. beating West Ham. 2-1. Sorted. And I'm a proper lad. See you later. No, don't do it. Don't do it. Proper lad. The Wednesday boy. <laughs> <laughs> For one neighbour, Elgol Court has loomed particularly large. Linda Robinson moved here 15 years ago to look after her father who lived on the 12th floor of the block. Linda has been given permission to pay her last respects before Elgol Court finally bites the dust. Dad's bedroom, and when he wasn't there, I used to sleep in the other bedroom. It's you know, it's not just bricks and mortar. It's with people here, you know. It's the first time I've been back since he died. I could face coming up before now. Look at that view. No, that was his washing line, but he never, he hardly ever did any washing. I'm sorry, it's just got me because, like I say, it's the first time I've been back since he died. Some might say it's daft, but it's like saying goodbye to my dad, finally, you know. It's the afternoon before the explosion. Company boss Charles Moran takes off for Elgol Court. Within minutes, he's spotted a problem. He calls Holly on the ground to remove three children playing within the perimeter fence. After the aerial survey, he heads for the blast floors to inspect Holly's work. I've got a lot of respect for Charles, a lot of time for him because he's given me an opportunity that I just wouldn't ever have got from anywhere else. I wouldn't have stood a chance if it weren't for Charles. He's made me, in a way, maybe it is good PR for controlled demolition, but I know for certain he wouldn't let me do the job if he didn't think I could do it. She's done very well. They uh, checked it out. I suspect her and the rest of the team have been up all night making sure there's nothing to find, but uh, it's uh, she's done very well, yeah. The, uh, the explosive layout and everything's OK. It's, that's per the normal standard. And the protection's very good as well. She, uh, she's just got to wait now and see whether everything else is OK. For Holly, the omens are good. The winds have dropped enough for the crew to hang the banner. You tie it off now. Yeah. Yeah, you can. It's 9.30. The building is ready for blowdown. The controlled demolition team now have just two hours to evacuate the area surrounding the site. Just about, there's still a couple, I haven't had the all clear yet um, from the Guinness Trust, so we'd say not everybody yet. Give it another quarter of an hour if you can, Ojin. Somebody's mentioned that the guy said he was going to put his sticker on his window and not come out. Um, we spoke to other residents who said he has gone out, so we're in a bit of a don't know situation. He's not actually in a position where he can walk into the zone, into the danger area. So what we're going to do is we're going to put a sentry on the, the gate, on the gate at his front door, and then if he does, we do find he's in there and he does try and come out, he can be stopped or we can stop the demolition until we clear him. The evacuees gather to watch the explosion at the school, 300 metres behind the building. It's going on for five minutes. Well, it'll be five minutes when the, um, the siren goes off, you know. Um, I've been trying to talk to people just to keep my mind occupied, really. 
They are. That's five minutes to go. The Guinness Trust have invited Louis Emmerich, a local soap opera star, to press the button. But his button is a fake. In reality, Holly will be igniting the firing line from a bunker on the other side of the building. The police, using a thermal imaging camera mounted on the nose of their helicopter, make a sweep of the exclusion zone to make sure everyone is out. With the all clear from the police helicopter, the countdown starts. Counting down from 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. myself and I'll tell you. I didn't look. Didn't you? No. I didn't think you'd be able no. to Just uh, clean up the site, make it safe, and job done. Not even a window. Brilliant. Not a window, not a substation, no nothing. <laughs> we are excellent. For Holly, the blowdown has been an unqualified success. Even the company banner, normally destroyed in the explosion, has survived. Served ourselves a thousand quid there. It's something up all afternoon. Well done, darling. Oh. Cut my brush. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so shaky. The Isles are a remote group of islands lying off the most northern point of Scotland. This is a beautiful and desolate place and one of the windiest in the UK. The population of just over 19,000 have put this wind to good use. The islands are at the forefront of wind-generated electric power and home to the LS1, a massive three megawatt wind turbine, the last of its kind. For the past 15 years, the 50-metre-high tower has dominated the Orkney skyline, but due to mechanical failure, it no longer generates power and it has to be demolished to make way for new, more efficient models. Angus Demolition have been hired to remove this white elephant, but getting the cranes big enough for the job anywhere near the LS1's remote location has proved impossible. Bringing this one down is a job for a detonator. Angus Demolition have hired an ex-military demolition engineer called John Parks of Dell Explosives. An unconventional outlook and continual experimentation ensure he is one of the top explosives men in Scotland. What I really want to show you is the power of a detonator, one single detonator. And what we'll do is we'll strap it on the bonnet of this vehicle and you'll see it'll blow a hole in the vehicle. And you can imagine what it does to your fingers and your eyes. 
through endless tinkering at his test range outside Edinburgh and his obsession with improving the safety aspects of controlled explosions, John has developed the reputation of a visionary radical in the explosives world. Light flashing out, five, four, three, two, one. And that would be your fingers off and blinded as well because there's a lot of fragmentation comes off the, the body of the detonator. John Park's life was changed in 1994 by witnessing a catastrophic demolition in Glasgow. Spectators reported being hit by flying debris and a series of investigations are now underway into how one woman died. Helen Tinney collapsed injured during the demolition and later died in hospital. Four other people were injured. After the death in Glasgow, John has spent the past seven years perfecting a technique to have more control over explosions. It was a black mark on the industry, you know. I thought about trying to do something a wee bit more scientific and started playing around with water bags in the, in the bath, as a matter of fact. Stand by, five, four, three, two, one, firing now. John has just blown up a piece of detonating cord and the decibel meter has gone right off the scale. It's overloaded, a single overloads at 135 dB. So it gives you some idea, uh, at 50 metres, or not even 50 metres from it, you see it overloaded the sound meter. What John has discovered is that by covering the charge with a plastic bag full of water, in this case just 30 gallons, the same amount of explosives produce significantly less noise without reducing the blast. Three, two, one, firing out. But the loudness of the explosion is just a small part of the problem. The, the, the two nasty things about explosions are the bang and the fragments. Uh, now, the, the, the sound pressure is, is really just a nuisance for, for most people in the public. Uh, the really dangerous thing is, is the fragments. And in the wrong circumstances, these can go two or three thousand meters and arrive with, with a high velocity and that's what the water bag suppression is very good for stopping. With the army showing interest in his technique, John's experiments progressed from water bags in the bath to the controlled explosion of a 500 pound mine. So the, the experiment was putting this mine uh, down on the ground. On one side there was a a wall of water on the other side there was no protection and we had two junk cars on either side and we fired the charge and we compared the damage to the two cars and I think on one of them you probably would have survived and the other one it, it was absolutely no chance at all it was completely wrecked look right through there part of the mine casing and this was the light end of the casing on the mine uh, the other one looks almost as if you could drive it away. It would seem that John Park's bath time experiments could have a major impact on explosive safety. The, the origin of, uh, of water suppression was entirely intuitive to start with. It, you know, it, it, it felt right and it turned out that it was right. That's actually true of an awful lot of things in technology, even if people don't always admit it afterwards. <laughs> John Parks has worked closely with Professor Stephen Salter of Edinburgh University to understand the physics of why the water bags work, and he still consults him on every job. The reason we plan to use the water suppression for Orkney is that there are several other turbines around and buildings and power connections and things which could be damaged if we don't keep the, all the frag in. And uh, so it's... Uh, Embarrassingly close to the vulnerable targets, I think, is the, is the best expression. And we're confident enough about the water now to be sure that, that we won't hurt anything. Despite John and the professor's confidence, toppling the LS1 is still a daunting prospect. Wind turbines have come a long way since the mid-70s, when it was still thought that size was everything. But with the wingspan of a jumbo jet and standing the height of Big Ben, for many locals, the LS1 has become a cherished landmark. Hugh Harker Johnson is an Orkney councillor and has been campaigning for its preservation. It was a, 
of great excitement to me when uh, they decided to build the world's biggest aerogenerator on the Burger Hill. And of course I was devastated now that they've decided to destroy it. It's a wonderful place to, to go to. I mean, I understand the desire, if you have a very specialist technique for the uh, precision destruction of tall monuments, I just wish they'd try it out on Nelson's column instead and leave us with our windmill. But Harker Johnson's campaign has come to nothing, and Angus demolition are moving in. In a way, um, it's another job for us. I don't really have any feelings about demolishing and taking it down. It's a contract that we've been employed to do. It's our business. Um, it's a challenge, especially since this is the biggest windmill in the world. Um, I'd like to be able to say that we took it down successfully. And the man with the water bags, who they have entrusted with the job, has finally arrived on Orkney. Uh, some may say it's urban vandalism to be taken down wind renewable energy sources, but they have served their purpose. Well, you're just making, taking down the old to make way for the new, you know, it's just part of the development of the thing, you know. Well, this is us approaching, <laughs> as we, it's called Burger Hill, but we've nicknamed it Hamburger Hill. You know? Up on Burger Hill, John is about to start battle with the very thing that brought the LS1 to Orkney. The wind. So, John, have you got a problem with the wind? Big problem. <laughs> so, as I said, it's always a controlling factor up here, you know. But we'll never be able to drop it against that wind. No, no, there's no way. And you don't, don't Especially with the, with the props still being on as well. Yeah. This is some radical rethinking. If we're no, we're not going to get a change in the wind. We're going to have to work on this one, then we're going to have to drop it that way. Then the problem we've got there is the main cable, which is now taking power from the two commission generators, you know. We've got to be very careful because this thing will go into the ground. John's problem is that this strong northwesterly will blow the turbine the wrong way. If the LS1 doesn't fall away from the newly commissioned turbines, one of its 30-metre blades could dig into the ground and rupture the power cable that supplies a quarter of Orkney's electricity. But this isn't John's only worry. Behind the LS1 is a bird reserve, home to the rare red-throated diver. This whole area is protected as a reserve, and uh, it's one of the breeding sites in the islands here for quite a scarce bird, the red-throated diver, known in Orkney as the rain goose. Uh, red-throated divers nest on these small hilltop locks because they're nice, safe places for them to be. It's, it's a good place for them to nest because they, they're very sensitive to disturbance. The dust and debris from the blast could pollute these locks. But more importantly, the turbine contains over 300 gallons of hydraulic oil. If this oil spills, the damage to the environment will be much worse. But there is one thing on John's side, and that's gravity. The oil would cause a problem here if we did not remove it, because when the structure hits the ground, there'll be a lot of devastation. Tanks will be ripped apart, hoses will be ripped off, tanks will be split. So up to now, we've removed something like 130, 140 gallons of various oils, hydraulic oils, gear oils, and residual oils that they kept here for topping systems up take it out at this stage, contain it, as opposed to having a mess later on, which is just unacceptable. Use gravity. <laughs> With the oil draining from the hydraulic systems above, the mechanical pecker starts to remove sections of the half metre thick walls. John's structural engineer has advised him that he could remove up to 80% of the base in this pre-weakening exercise. It's Wednesday and the blowdown is scheduled for Saturday. But the persistent gale force northwest wind is giving John some serious concerns. We're on this project at Burger Hill and we're looking for a projected weather forecast for the next few days. Can you help us? The projected weather report is bad news for John. The wind is due to drop on Friday, change direction, then blow a gale from the southwest. Friday is the only window for blowdown, 24 hours ahead of schedule. An emergency meeting is convened. 
What we don't want to do is once it starts moving, we don't want the wind even trying to hold it there. Or worse still, trying to push it back the other way. You've got to go with the wind. We'll aim for Friday. Yeah. But if the wind's still going, we'll, we'll, we'll commit tomorrow. Well, tomorrow's another day, you know. The best laid plans of mice and men. What this means is that there's no sleep for John and his boys. And the forecast this morning comes for the Aberdeen Weather Centre. Good morning, and the windy weather will persist over the next couple of days. Before Thursday morning, and the wind has shown no signs of abating. Since tomorrow looks like their only window, John must do a test blast today to determine exactly how to bring down the LS1. He needs to find out how much explosives to use to buckle the tower's steel reinforcement and where to put them if the tower is going to come down in the right direction. It is also his first chance to try out his water bags away from the testing ground. Well, it's a tough building. There's a lot of steel in there, a lot of reinforcement. So, and you don't get a second chance with a thing like that, so you've got to come down first time. It's a precision job. Too small a charge and John will learn nothing. Too big a charge and the results could be disastrous. On Orkney, maverick inventor and explosives engineer John Parks is battling against time and the weather in his bid to blow up the world's biggest wind turbine. His success is going to depend on this morning's test blast and whether his new water suppression technique really works. The water bags seem to have done their job. And this is ideal here. We replicate this. When we fire the actual target, there is no problem about a collapse. From the test blast, John knows that he can fracture the concrete and bend the steel reinforcing bars sufficiently to bring down the structure. But he also has to consider the 16 massive tendons that hold the steel turbine onto the concrete tower. I want to phone our uh, consultant engineers just to check on a couple of details on the tendons. So the tendon that you, you see, that is, not a, that is not one big cable. That's a multitude of cables in there, 18 finer cables. These 16 massive tendons are what hold the 60-ton wind turbine onto the top of the concrete tower. If we cut these now, that would leave the hole in the cell, or the engine house, whatever you want to be, being held only in four bolts. If the wind comes round to where we want it to be, what we didn't want to have is the, the nacelle breaking off. <laughs> if the steel structure was to fall off, John would not only endanger the lives of his men below, but he would also run the risk of rupturing the mains power cable from the two newly commissioned wind turbines. We're at, uh, we're at the ball breaking phase, so it's, weak, it's, it's a hard slog, you know, drilling and finishing the pre-weakening. While John supervises pre-weakening and drilling boreholes for his explosives, Buster and Phil start to prepare the components that they will need to suppress this massive blast. Well, the machine's broken. Oh, the, <laughs> the machine is broken down. Burst hydraulic pipe. So we're going to lose probably two hours. And with only 15 hours to go before blowdown, any delay could be critical. But John's putting a brave face on it. He's even marked the ground where he expects the turbine to fall. If, if you can see that tomorrow, then you know we're offline. So ideally, that should be smack in the middle of the tower and hidden. If the LS1 misses the yellow line, John will be in trouble. He's got the new generators and their power cable to the rear and the highly protected bird reserve to the side. To fell the tower accurately, he must get the charging absolutely right. What happens is when that goes into the hole, the tail ends come out and then we connect up with more detonating cord. So when we initiate one end, the whole lot will explode. Problems that you have is when you're laying it out is to make sure that you don't cross detonating cord because it will cut and cause misfires. A misfire could leave the tower standing but dangerously unstable. For the second night running, the team burn the midnight oil, carefully packing over 100 charges. 
basically it's an exploding fuse which carries a detonation wave down to all the charges simultaneously. It is very loud. Not only is it very loud, it's very explosive. With a detonation velocity of around 8,000 meters per second, the massive explosion created by these charges needs to be contained, and John's new water suppression technique should be just the job. If you have fragments that are going through air, there's a drag on them, but when they're going through water, the drag's about 800 times more. So uh, particles that are moving will be slowed down much more quickly by having to go through water. In fact, a rifle bullet won't go through more than a few, few inches of water. Wing film, or stretch wrap, or pallet wrap, it's made of the same material as Kevlar, which is plastic armor. And Michael Caine would say, not a lot of people know that, he gets the right answers uh, very instinctively. He's one of the most intuitive people I've ever worked with. Now, see, that's untidy now. The top's all bulging like a jock strap. That's the worst net I've ever seen. Well, I like making things, and he likes blowing them up. I think <laughs> that's the mixture. It's the early hours of the morning, and the team have almost completed their task. Torch. It's on top of the... Uh... Just get it, I need it. A bloody good <laughs> shit. The weather forecast seems to be correct. It's raining, but the wind has dropped. As long as John and the team can keep their generator full of petrol, they should catch the much anticipated weather window. I don't know what time it is now. It's about two o'clock or three o'clock, I don't know. Friday morning, and for John and his team, things are looking very good. There is a light wind, but it's blowing in the right direction. The team have been working for 36 hours straight in order to catch these ideal conditions. A call is made to inform the police of the time of detonation. We had to make up the 24 hours to catch this window, so that's why burning the midnight oil last night. The site is tidied and an exclusion zone of one kilometre is imposed. John calls one last meeting to run through safety procedure before blowdown. The only concern really is if anything breaks off any of the props. If you see anything coming up that way, try and, well not try, get everybody in a position that they're standing behind something. Mm -hmm. you know? We'll get Claxton 10 seconds before we fire. Nobody move at all until we're done clear for misfires. That'll take about five minutes. I'll give two long blasts if it's all clear. If we get a stand up, just hold it. We're just waiting for John to cut the final tendons. And uh, basically, we're on time for 12 o'clock today. So, everything so far, so good. I'm sure it'll, it's going to go in the right direction. And if it doesn't? If it doesn't, well, we're going to be here longer than we thought. Angus Demolition have a lot to lose. If it falls in the wrong direction, it could cost in excess of £100,000 to rectify the mistake. You could fire the hell and fool them all it. Success. Happy man. Aye. Right in the middle of the road. Brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> So 
Yeah, was that, that as good as it gets? Well, I don't know. <laughs> it's down, it's going to the yellow line. Follow the yellow brick road. What was the bet you said? If we can see that, we're in trouble. It's come down the right place for us. It looks a lot bigger when it's on the ground as well. But uh, we've got a job to do now. Well done, John. That's well done. Well, we, we aim to please. Not a drop of oil has been spilled into the nature reserve and the power cables from the new windmills are undamaged. John's experiments in the bath have paid off. Yeah, yeah, I've got a job. Warrant Officer Simon Wilkinson is a bomb disposal officer working at RAF Northolt just outside London. He deals with around 25 emergency calls a month, the majority of which end up in controlled explosions. What have we got, Simon? Uh, not too sure yet. It's um, basically some sort of shell. Um, not too sure exactly what type it is yet. Simon has been a bomb disposal officer for the last 11 years and has survived two tours of Northern Ireland. Earlier today, a resident of nearby Rushton found a suspect shell in their granddad's shed and Simon has been called to investigate. There's always going to be a risk with, when you're dealing with explosives of any sort, you know. There's always going to be a risk that something could go wrong, but on the whole, you believe that everything is going to be right. I don't think that you, that you could be a, a bomb disposal officer if you believed that you were going to get killed. What's that then? Um, it's a uh, trench mortar, German one from, uh, I think, 1916, the, around that time. So, uh, yeah, we'll, uh, we'll go and blow that one up. OK? On. Yeah. Safe to pick it up, is it, Simon? I hope so. Otherwise, <laughs> it's a bit of a daft question after just picked it up, isn't it? <laughs> Uh, yeah, yeah, it was safe to pick it up, yeah. But uh, the type of explosive that, that's in there, it's um, because, it, because it's so old, that it's, it's better for us to actually get rid of it. While the police clear the area, Simon and his number two bury the unexploded bomb and attach the detonating cord. Then Jay connects the other end to the firing box and lets it rip. Stand by! Fire it! Simon, how's that? Well, that obviously worked. I said that was fairly successful. Blowing up old war debris is one thing, but for bomb disposal officers, the threat of a terrorist attack is ever present. To keep up to date with the latest terrorist techniques, all bomb disposal officers have to be retested every six months in a stressful examination process known as licensing. It's very important that you actually pass the license and exercise, otherwise you're not able to carry out the job of a uh, bomb disposal operator and effectively you're useless within, um, within the troop. On the day before his exam, Simon is doing some last minute preparation. Obviously you, you, you deal with things in your, your own particular way, some people deal with it better than others, but uh, yeah, I think everyone feels the, the stress, yeah. Smudge looks after all this kit, um, supposedly, we'll see. Well, see, because if it doesn't start working, then obviously it hasn't done. And it, it will drive the wheelbarrow. This is the, the Mark 8 Bravo wheelbarrow. It has uh, an awful lot of capabilities, far different, really, from the first wheelbarrow, what, which was, in effect, a modified electric wheelbarrow, which was just designed to tow a, a car out of its position. Over the years, the, the wheelbarrows uh, have undoubtedly saved countless lives, yeah. Cameras mounted on the nodding arm allow the operator to see what the wheelbarrow is doing, and weapons at the front fire a high-velocity disruption charge at anything which gets in its way. With the kit checked and ready to go, all Simon needs to do now is impress the examiners, known as the DS panel. I know too many people at DS in this week, unfortunately. 
So I'll have it in for me. There'll be bombs everywhere. And the DS who everyone fears the most is the head of the directing staff, Warrant Officer B.J. Clark. A bomb disposal officer for the last 25 years and a notoriously outspoken examiner. You can separate the men from the boys and the guys who can do it and the guys who can't do it because they don't gain the relevant information to start with, they don't make a good assessment because they've got poor information, they then, because of that poor assessment, they make a poor plan and then they poorly execute the poor plan and then in the end, you know, you end up with an operator who's over the other side of the training area, nowhere near the bomb. It's licensing day and the day of reckoning for Simon and the four other bomb disposal officers also being examined. They've traveled from all over the country to a location so secret that it does not appear on any civilian maps. Each of them will have 10 hours to deal with four different bomb scares set up in various parts of a fake village built specially for the purpose. For each setup, the examiners draft in real policemen and actors to play the parts of civilians. We're here to, we're here to make the, uh, the scenario as real as possible. Um, they've asked us to come along and um, to actually input as, as the police would deal with the incident, a suspicious package. We turn up, as you've seen, it's all purpose built. We speak to the role player uh, for the purposes, who's obviously t playing the part of a civilian. We'll question him just as we would on the streets. At the next setup, there's a village, and he's got to play the part of a village idiot, which. <laughs> <laughs> You wouldn't play that part, no. would you, mate? No, no. Taff Began is a bomb disposal officer from Wales, also being examined today. His first job is to investigate a radio, which the actor has been asked by his neighbour to take on a flight to Jordan. Taff is rightly suspicious. Were you going to take any luggage with you apart from this suitcase of his? Uh, not really. I mean, he said everything would be out there anyway. He just said, oh, okay. I forgot this suitcase. Do you not think that's a bit strange? Yeah, I yeah. Know. yeah, yeah, all right. Okay. Not getting that, yeah. I'm oh, just saying, yeah. you know, it is a bit strange, isn't it? Oh, he's, yeah. he's not going to tell you when he's going to pick you up, addresses, no. contact, Nothing. anything. All right, okay. He's not expecting you to arrive, really, is he? No. Because the radio has already been moved, Taff knows that the bomb is not booby trapped and so decides to approach on foot. He takes with him one of the high powered weapons to destroy the bomb. Stand by! Fine! We've uh, disrupted it and made it safe. So, uh, American Airlines, I'm sure, will be happy about that. Not losing 300 people and one of their jumbo jets. How do you think it went? All right. Yeah, I'm alive. Bomb's dead. But while Taff has already completed his first task, Simon is still stuck in the car park. Oh dear, oh dear, oh dear. <laughs> the, uh, the fibre optic link wasn't working this morning for some reason. Um, guys have just had a look at it, they can't fix it now, so we're just going to go with the um, radio control mode and um, they'll see if they can fix us another wheelbarrow for later on. So that's uh, an hour late now for this job. So just have to get a move on, I suppose. Simon is off to a bad start but the EOD officers at BJ's task are really feeling the strain. It's not uncommon for people to throw up. Because <laughs> they're just so, so stressed out. It would be nice for just the people to be able to relax. You know, when I do licensing, you know, I find it a very pleasurable experience. You know, it's a testing environment, but at the same time, you know, I'm not going to be too concerned about it. Mind you, I am an EOD god. With their wheelbarrow repaired as best they can, Simon and Smudge arrive at their first job over an hour late. You never work on the basis that, oh, everything's going to go wrong today, because if it did, you'd just stay in bed, wouldn't you? Say you were ill. I don't know. But, you, you know, nobody's going to go out there and, and do something that if they think, you know, they're going to get killed. It just, it just doesn't happen. But it looks a little bit, a bit like it could be some kind of mortar or something. Let's get a wheelbarrow or something. Yeah. Uh, so. There is a, um, an MP around this area who may well be a target for um, Republican-type terrorists. That's all we know at the moment. Um, we're going to send the wheelbarrow down there. The presence of the MP alerts Simon to the fact that this could be an IRA-style device and so he needs to be extra careful. 
In Northern Ireland, the environment is, is what we would term a high threat environment in as much as rather than going out to deal with a device, when we turn up, we've got to think that possibly uh, we are the target. Sure enough, it's a classic mortar bomb. Through the wheelbarrow's onboard cameras, Simon quickly spots the rocket launcher buried under some ferns and a wire connecting it to a remote firing box. In order to stop the mortar firing, he needs to destroy the wire. Stand by! Firing! <laughs> We've not cut it. Oh, are you joking? No. But Simon and Smudge are out of luck. The cable is still intact. So instead, they decide to attack the firing box at the other end of the wire. If they can destroy that, the mortar will be safe. We believe we found the, um, the sort of command box, if you like, that's actually going to fire it off. So we're going to carry out a uh, yeah, cross Stand off. by! Firing! Well, I don't know. It could, have, it could have been a lot better, as it didn't fail then obviously that is a bonus, but, uh, but yeah, it could have been better. He did okay. A um, little bit rusty in places, but he's been out of it for uh, a few months. Uh, but overall, he achieved his aim safely, um, returned the area to normality quite quickly, and obviously rendered the device safe. Even though this is a fictional village with fake bombs, all members of the bomb squad take the exam very seriously. They know that their profession is a dangerous one, and mistakes in the real world can be fatal. Well, luckily, I don't know actually, because I think I was too stupid. Because when I was younger and I did all my island tours, I enjoyed it so immensely, the challenge and the, and the danger and all this sort of thing. And it's, it was only towards the end of my tours when I had seen a lot of dead bodies and things like this, uh, that I think, you know, you just, you then get a little bit of common sense and you think, this is not a joke. And it does scare now, it scares the living I mean, honestly. Uh, but then, I was like, woohoo, big bombs, big noises. Blow it up, brilliant, isn't it? And of course you get all the chicks. Simon's second task is a straightforward letter bomb found in the bank. It's a chance for him to make up for lost time. Does this definitely come through Royal Mail then? Come through Royal Mail, yeah, it's Frank to uh, We'll see how it goes. It's, it doesn't appear too difficult as of yet, but that is easier to say at this stage. We may well even get it finished within the time frame. Simon decides it's safe enough to approach on foot, but before he sets off, he has to put on his bomb suit. From some smaller, low explosive devices, it will actually protect you, but um, for high explosive devices, if you're close to them, then it's, you know, it's, it's not gonna help you at all. It's a knockout, that's it, isn't it? because you just can't do anything in this at all. I think it's just designed to make you look a fool, make things as difficult as possible. Simon is feeling confident, but the letter bomb is trickier than he imagines. He needs to blow it up, but if he destroys it entirely, there won't be any forensic evidence left for the police. Choosing the right size of disruptor is vital. The normal type of disruptor I would have used is probably not gonna be good enough for the job. The next size up is, is too much overkill, really. So I've, I've tried to make a compromise by adapting the, uh, the larger disruptor and therefore just take out a specific component of the device. Stand by! Firing! The British anti-terrorist bomb squad are being examined at a secret location in the Midlands. To keep their jobs, they must each dispose safely of four bombs hidden throughout a fake village. But for Warrant Officer Simon Wilkinson, things are not going well. Stand by! Firing! Oh, that's what I was doing to me. I suppose you thought I was fine, didn't you? Stand by! Firing! Second time lucky, and Simon's gamble seems to have paid off. As they carry out their tasks, the bomb disposal officers are closely scrutinised by the examiners. A single bad decision, and they could lose their licence to detonate. Successful one, Simon. Uh, yeah, hopefully. We'll see, won't we? He did make the right decision. Um, quite rightly, the use of the small weapon may not have achieved the results what he wanted to what he wanted to get. So therefore, he opted for the for the bigger disruptor, which, as you saw, achieved his aim. 
For his next task, over on the other side of the village, bomb disposal officer Taff Began is up against the heavyweight examiner, BJ Clark. You come into the trade as a lance corporal. You then become a full corporal. You do a tour in Northern Ireland as a number two on the bomb team, which is a very exciting thing to do. It's an exciting place to be. And what happens is you sort of almost gravitate into it. So you're sort of like a senior staff sergeant and you stop and think, well, how the hell did I get to this position where I'm in an NBC suit with my respirator on, crawling along this ditch looking for tripwires in the middle of the night? Why am I so stupid? Why am I an electrician? Why am I a male model? Under BJ's watchful eye, Taff Began prepares himself to do what every bomb disposal officer fears the most. You know, it's, it's an unnatural thing to walk down to a bomb and then try and defuse it. You don't scare yourself, you don't think of the, the fright factor. We obey certain rules and regulations which have been designed over the last 30 years to protect us as much as possible. But BJ thinks there's more to it than this. I always find that, you know, bomb disposal at this sort of stage, you can almost turn it into a, like a, a Zen Buddhist thing, you know what I mean? And, you know, it's like, be the bomb, you know, feel your way, be spiritual about it. It's like, you know, being a tribesman in, in Africa and things like that, you know, you can interact better with your environment. And if your environment happens to have a bomb in it, then that's OK. It is a, very much a, a difference to, say, the American way of bomb disposal, where they have set procedures for everything. If you exercise them on a slightly different scenario than they're not used to, they say, well, we don't do this sort of scenario. So, well, does the terrorist know you don't do this scenario? In this town, however, the bombs are built by fellow soldiers. Known as the duty terrorists, their job is to try and outwit the officers being examined. You've got to get into the mindset of being a terrorist. You've got to think. We can't just put bombs out and go throw it in the back of a car because the terrorists and criminals just don't do that. They think and they plan ahead. So we've got to sit down and think where we're going to deploy these, these devices. Some people might say that we've slightly um, disturbed ourselves. It's not good when one of them fails because it just means that uh, one of our bombs has beaten them. And we're de definitely not as sophisticated in techniques, perhaps, as a, a criminal or a terrorist would be. In the past, uh, if we did actually get a kill on an operator with a device that would lay it out, then we would actually get a crate of beer. So uh, if you end up killing a few, you're going to be fairly drunk by the end of the week. And over on the other side of the town, it looks like the duty terrorists are in for a crate of beer sooner than expected. They're doing OK, but it's uh, immensely slow. Uh, they really should have had this wrapped up uh, pretty quickly within about half an hour, and uh, they've been on the task now about an hour and a half. The officer is meant to be dealing with an IRA car bomb, but he's not treating it as such. If he doesn't alert a specialist Northern Ireland operator soon, he will automatically fail. OK, unfortunately, he's failed that task for a number of reasons. The key issue was that um, he actually broke a mandatory action. That is absolutely black and white. Meanwhile, Simon's on his way to the last task. He needs a good pass if he's going to keep his licence, and only BJ stands in his way. A suspect torch bomb has been found in a toolkit down at the farm. But time is running out. We identified that the torch had a, um, some form of explosive device in there. Because it's safer, we sent down the remote equipment um, to carry out a disruption on that device. Right. Go forward on that. Um, go forward at that. Smudge is just breaking a bit more kit. <laughs> yeah, bring it back, mate. For the third time today, the wheelbarrow has let them down, and BJ has had enough. Simon is forced to make a manual approach. But in his haste to get the job done, he seems to be slipping up at the last. BJ is not impressed. Basically, he stored a little bit of trouble for himself up here. What would have been nice at this stage is to put some forensic drop sheets or bags down and take the items out of the bag and x-ray them there. Now, what that would have meant is if one item was booby-trapped and the other wouldn't, you could then separate the two and just deal with whatever item you wanted to. Unfortunately, he's not done that. You can think things are going all wrong and then everything's fine, and you can think things are going really well, and then they'll turn around and say, oh, but you forgot this, and like, yeah, I did. So, who knows? 
Who knows? I, I would, I would hate to say. He's now two hours behind schedule, and things aren't getting any easier. Stand by! Firing! <laughs> Did that go off, did it, mate? Stand by! Firing! Solomon's disrupted the torch with a weapon, but at the same time, he's damaged a lot of the other forensic evidence uh, through not thinking about the placement of his weapon it is, it's not a failure. However, for someone of his stature, it's a very disappointing result for me because I would have expected that at the end of this task to be presented with the maximum amount of forensic. And really, we've not got the minimum amount, but we're close to it. He has rendered the device safe, he has achieved his aim, and he has been safe. But that's about a lot. For Simon and Smudge, the day is almost over. They've completed all their tasks, but they still might fail. The examiners meet to discuss each bomb disposal officer's performance in a brutal session known as Christians and Lions. There's an anxious wait ahead as one by one, the bomb men are summoned to hear their fate. I don't think you ever get promoted. I think you just uh, get thrown to the Lions, to be honest. It's not fun. Don't think anyone enjoys it. Got a, an eight-month license as opposed to a six-month license and recommended for the DS panel. Taff is a happy man, but Simon has been in there for half an hour. Yet, despite all the technical mishaps, he's passed. I'm off. <laughs> Just 24 hours after leaving the fictional village and the fake bombs, he's back on the streets in the real world. A suspicious package has just been found in the town of St Albans, and the police have requested emergency assistance. Um, yeah, they've, they've got a, uh, a suspect package, which is a, a biscuit tin. Um, We've seen it on CCTV and the, the believes that um, you know it's suspicious for a, a number of reasons. We have had history in this town, you know, of bombings before, and um, the, the police know of people who've um, put out hoax devices and things like that. So they've got reason to believe, yes, there's a possibility it could be a device. So why take the chance? Simon parks his van 150 metres away from the bomb and assesses the situation. down there. Um, obviously, I've looked at it through the wheel, but I carry out a controlled explosion on it with one of the disruptors. The police are taking no chances and have evacuated the city centre. It's a precision job, but luckily, when it really matters, the wheelbarrow seems to be responding. Stand by! Got straight up there, smacked it, and uh, contained nothing in the end. Yeah, all we're going to do now is uh, collect the forensics. And uh, that's just the fit in there. It may well have been uh, totally innocuous, just some rubbish that had been left there by somebody um, with no harm intended, or it may have been someone put it there to, you know, to actually cause a disturbance, a sort of hoax. But um, First Friday afternoon job fit. Well, at least it's over and done with. We might get back for knocking off time, so that would be a bonus, yeah. I don't think it's myself of a hero at all, no. No, and I'm quite sure that a lot of people would laugh if it's anything different. Part of the English countryside, there stands a great British monument, a treasured legacy to the art of Victorian engineering 
For the last 130 years, the East Norton Viaduct has dominated this corner of Leicestershire. It took 100 men over two years to build, but it's been closed to train since 1953, and 30 years ago, the tracks were ripped out. Now the old brickwork is starting to crumble, and there's only one thing left for this viaduct, explosive demolition. The contractor in charge of its downfall is Mark Coleman. More used to building structures than demolishing them, his company hasn't had that much experience in this field. It's the second time that we've been involved with explosive demolition. Each of them have been a first for us and a first for many. This being a 13-span brick viaduct, an unusual structure that generally uh, are retained, but uh, owing to the poor structural condition that we have here, they've decided that uh, the only option is for it to be taken down by the controlled use of explosives. The structure itself is about the length of two football pitches. It's approximately 10 to 12 storeys in height, and the, the principal idea behind the collapse is to take the middle of the structure out first and work back to each abutment over a period of two seconds. You always have a few tense moments with this type of work, and it's certainly not work that should be carried out by the faint-hearted. Phil Lowe is far from faint-hearted. An explosives demolition expert and Taekwondo fanatic, he has over 3,500 explosions under his belt and is just the man Mark needs for the job. I've been in an explosive nearly all my life. My father was an explosive engineer. We've demolished over 3,500 structures at all types of buildings, ranging from industrial structures, gas holders, furnaces, boilers, trains, residential buildings, high-rise buildings, to motorway bridges, concrete bridges and viaducts. Now that's all we do, demolition, explosive demolition. <laughs> Phil learnt everything he knows about explosives from his dad. And although his father is now retired, Phil still values his advice, so he's taking him for a first look at this tricky viaduct. The last one we did, similar to this, was done in when Saddam Hussein was uh, being bombed by the Americans. We'd got it all charged up overnight, didn't we? Yep. And we dropped the bridge the same time as Baghdad was being bombed. What's he said today? Oh, he said you're also too deep or, or whatever on there, but, but I noticed that as well, you see, so. Armed with his father's wise words, Phil has only got two more weeks to prepare the viaduct for blowdown. He and his team have already started drilling the blast holes, but the vibrations are having unwanted side effects. For the first time, they're beginning to appreciate just how unsafe the structure oh, is. That's where it just dropped. There's a lump ready to come any time. It's just, if your time's up, your time's up. Same as crossing the road. I'd be a lot safer when it's on the ground. I mean, public or the, the farmer could have been walking through there or somebody with a dog, and then that's it, they're dead. So it's safer on the floor. It's saved its purpose, it's probably done a good job at the past, but it's dangerous now. Despite the loose brickwork on the external wall, the Victorians built their viaducts to last. There are over five million bricks here and Phil's main problem is going to be getting enough explosives into the structure to bring it all down. Phil and the gang will need to drill over 800 holes in which to pack their explosives, some of the holes over six metres deep. To drill holes this deep, you need a bit of extra help, but the hydraulic drills they're using are a bit of a hazard in themselves. And that's capable of lifting a car, tipping it over on its back. There's that much power in that leg. Yep, so the guys who get on who's not experienced and they've had the legs shoot out, legs broke, the mates have been crushed at the side of it, so you've got to be competent to get on them. What can happen, it can slip out, dry can be stood there, and then I broke the leg. When you see the, the television, when you see the Vince Eastwoods and Lee Marvins and John Wayne that come with the, <laughs> the overalls and the three sticks of dynamite and put them inside of a leg and light the fuse and bang and then half the city's demolished. It doesn't don't work like that. <laughs> if it did, we won't, we won't have all this hard work.
The next morning, the effects of all that drilling have taken their toll on the bridge. Site foreman Tom Phillips is the first man on site. Well, between four o'clock yesterday afternoon and eight o'clock this morning, we've had a partial collapse of a pier, or the facer of a pier, um, which just goes to prove how unsafe the bridge is. Uh, basically, what we've had to do is put a, um, an exclusion zone around the pier because I'm still a bit concerned to get some more off. Thankful to be alive when you see things like that. <laughs> We'd have all ended up with it very bad headaches, if not more than that. And I believe a lot of people want the bridge to stay, but that just goes to prove that it is in a bad state. Despite the obvious danger overhead, a group of local residents have been protesting against the demolition. Bet Wade, who comes from a long tradition of railway children, has led the campaign. Her father was the local station master, her husband was a steam train driver, and she's lived all her life with the viaduct at the bottom of her garden. Quite honestly, over this uh, blowing the viaduct up, I think it's a crying shame. It's a landmark. You can see it for miles round, that's the thing. So it's going to be really missed. We tried to get a preservation order on it, but they made the mind up and <laughs> that was it. <laughs> it's going to be an awful gap there, isn't it? Bet now knows that the viaduct's fate is sealed. But Phil, drilling blast holes into the crowns of the arches to blow them from above, is not about to get sentimental. You can't be sad if it's your livelihood, can you? <laughs> so you see office blocks, tower blocks and bridges and viaducts and chimneys and cooling towers and pound size flickering on the eyes all the, all the way. <laughs> I've been on holiday and I've, I've been staying in an hotel and everybody else is sitting there sunbathing and I'm looking, thinking how I'm going to mark the columns up and drop the building over. And <laughs> I get elbowed and <laughs> we're on holiday. <laughs> we can't stop putting crosses on this wall. <laughs> With the viaduct doomed, all sorts of people have been coming out to pay their last respects. But Gordon Humphrey has taken his interest a little further than most. I think too many things disappear without anybody actually keeping any records. I thought it's a shame if the viaduct disappeared without anybody recording it. The pier on the opposite side is actually 620 foot 2 inches long. I know it because I measured it. To actually get the measurements of all the stones actually gives it possibility for anyone who wants to make a model in the future. I've got to model a railway at home, and one day I might find an area in it where I could fit something like this viaduct, and it's rather an attractive viaduct that would go nicely on the layout. Three foot three, three foot six, we all have to have a little bit of eccentricity about us, and uh, this is mine. Two foot nine and a half, four foot two and a half. Eight days till blowdown, and the weather has taken a turn for the worse. With less than half the 800 blast holes completed, the lads are finding that their high-powered drills are not as high-powered as they thought. Them. Just freeze up. Ah, uh, they don't like ice. How much do you love this ride up now? Love to see back on it. Roll on a week tomorrow. Yeah. That's it. Roll on a week tomorrow. Under these atrocious conditions, drilling is abandoned for the day. Phil, however, takes advantage of the break to test a sample of the explosive he intends to use on the viaduct. For him, being back on the range is a bit like going home. I came here when I just started with my father, very young. Uh, what I did, they brought me around the factory just to show me the materials being made. Yeah, no, it's like, it's like an old friend. It's something I've been using for 20 years and my father had been using for 20 years before that. Phil is one of the few explosives engineers in the country still using the traditional sticks of dynamite. With 100,000 tonnes of viaduct to demolish, he needs all the explosive power he can get. 
Chelignite might be old-fashioned, but it sure packs a hell of a punch. So how many sticks of that will you be getting off Phil for, for the viaduct? For the viaduct, 16 boxes, which is 4,000 of those sticks. That should be enough. <laughs> should be enough. Phil may be feeling confident, but with the delays caused by the bad weather, he's desperate to start putting the explosives into the viaduct. Once each stick of dynamite is connected to a detonator, they're stuffed, up to eight at a time, into the blast holes and then plugged with a lump of clay. By the time he's finished, the whole structure will be riddled with gelignite. It's a big, it's a big robust structure and it, it, it's not going to lend itself easily. So you, uh, you've got to do the right, right amount of explosive work in the right areas to get the thing to come down as planned and then you've got to use the correct charge weight just short of half a ton of explosives will be in the bridge in total so you know in, in just under 800 shot holes so you know there's a fair bit of welly going into it and it needs that to bring it down so but at each end of the viaduct the victorians built special smaller sturdier stop arches specifically designed to keep the viaduct from collapsing just how much explosives it'll take to bring these stop arches down is anybody's guess. Taekwondo fanatic and explosives engineer Phil Lowe has a reputation for destroying unusual structures. The 130-year-old East Norton Viaduct in Leicestershire, England, is next in line, but it's not giving itself up easily. Last week's snow has put Phil and the team behind schedule. So he's called on an old friend of his father's to give him a hand. I've done one or two in my time before, and uh, it's it looks if it's you know it's been quite difficult to, to load. The uh, the holes are broken up inside, and uh, you need someone with a little bit of experience to charge it up. It's big, it's heavy. Uh, take the bottom out, and the top's got to come down anyway. The last five minutes before you fire any, any structure, the adrenaline is really pumping. And uh, that's what makes the job. It's not just the weather that might delay the blowdown. For years, several colonies of rare bats have used these arches for shelter. And for the last 18 months, Batman Robert Stebbings has been trying to persuade them to leave. So it's not all just heavy machinery and railway fanatics around here? Uh, no, I'm afraid us wildlife people have to come and get the animals out of the way before the work can really take place here. Robert has already set up exclusion devices in over a thousand nooks and crannies in the viaducts where the bats might live. But if he finds evidence that just one mating pair have not yet moved out, the blowdown will have to be postponed. Well, you can't be afraid of heights if you work in our kind of business. Wildlife is where it is, and we have to go out there to find them and hopefully solve any problems that need solving. Do you think the bats appreciate it? Uh, no, they probably don't like us at all because we're excluding them from places they want to live. Now, there's a little cavity in there, and we can probably just fill it up with a bit of foam just to stop them using it as a nest site. At the end of a long day up the cherry picker, he's checked, rechecked, and foam filled dozens more potential bat homes. But now, with regret, he must concede that the blowdown can go ahead. I am reasonably confident it is bat free at this moment, yes. But I always feel it's sad losing um, any rather nice structure that provides safe places for bats to live. Bats are my first love. It's the day before blowdown, and Mark Coleman is back on the site to check on Phil's progress. But the fog is a bit of a worry, because by law, the sentries positioned around the exclusion zone have to be able to see each other before the blowdown can take place. Nevertheless, Mark is confident. Everything appears to be fine with what's been completed with uh, Phil's work to date. We've been around and we've checked the charging, the stemming, the connections, uh, and then all the at source protection. We've not found any areas where we're concerned, and certainly all the, the workmanship seems to be up to spec. As it's only Coleman & Co's second explosive demolition, Mark knows that it's crucial that he gets some good publicity if he's going to make a name for himself in this business. 
Uh, we've obviously got TV, there's press, there's uh, the trade journals. Everybody's looking at it, everybody's interested. If it goes wrong, it's there for everybody to see. And that's probably better news for them uh, than it actually going right, some may say. Because everybody likes a bit of bad publicity, don't they? For maximum coverage, Mark wants to hang two banners attached to each other by ropes, one on each side of the viaduct. But with only a handful of men on site, the scaffolding poles which will weigh the banners down are too heavy to lift over the side all at once. It's a good idea, there's no, there's no dispute in that. It's just a pain in the arse to achieve it. At the other end of the viaduct, the explosives engineers are none too impressed. Oh, it's a bit of yesterday morning, huh? Pay good money, get good luck. But you're not going to get involved? No, no, no. no, no. Too busy. Yeah, that's their problem. Well, that's what we did. Pay feet up, you get monkeys. I think we just have to leave it. Well, we've got 30 blokes tomorrow, so... It'll be a lot easier. I live in the house just up in the village, um, the last house in the village, so we look out over the valley here. I'm going to lose my garden ornament, I'm afraid. I can't get another one like this. There you go. So will you be watching it go down on Sunday? Oh yes, we're having a, a village soiree in, in the house. We've got a very big conservatory on the back of the house, it's about 60 foot long, so people can stand in, in the dryer and if it's raining or whatever, and no doubt we'll be providing refreshments, tea and coffee and the likes during the the morning so people can, uh, you know, stand and watch. But tomorrow isn't going to be quite such fun for everyone. We've had enough for today. Uh, with this heavy mist and how we cast, it's going to be dark enough now, so... It's not worth loading in the dark anyway. Out of 100, how, how sure are you that it's going to come down in the right place? Should be OK. Be OK. I should be OK. It should be OK. Out of 100? It should be OK. should be 100. <laughs> should be OK. Yeah, I'll wake up in the morning and I'll... What am I today? Oh, yeah, yeah but not vied up. <laughs> it's the way it is. It's always the same on every bus job. Never alters. And as soon as the final blowdown, it just changes. I mean, he's got a lot on his plate, you know what I mean? If that don't go down, then it's a big embarrassment. Well, that will go down. Bang, bang on time. <laughs> About three hours. We've got three hours left till D Day. We're all here, it's all sorted and all systems go. Perfect weather conditions and uh, the banners went out relatively easy, so some of the major headaches out of the way. Nervous? I am slightly nervous, yeah, which is a, a good thing. It keeps you on edge, it keeps you awake. I don't know what I'm worried about, but the adrenaline's starting to flow. <laughs> With an hour to go, sentries are posted 200 metres apart around the edge of a three kilometre exclusion zone. While overhead, the police helicopter, with a thermal imaging camera mounted on its nose, starts a final flyby to ensure no one has crept in overnight. They're going to commence the search uh, now, and, and if they uh, detect any heat sources that are not happy with, they'll report that through me. Put it this way, yeah, I like explosion. I like to see the big bang and see it come down in a ball of smoke. It's a sad day for the people of East Norton, yes. I've lived here for 26 years and uh, walked over the viaduct many times. We're losing our heritage. That's what we're losing. 400 kilos of explosives tucked into the bridge ready to blow. They'd only got to put notices up. You go over it or under it at your, your own risk and it had stood another 100 years. It's blowing up time, isn't it? 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 
Well, five. sections there which obviously haven't we've got one there where basically you can see the size of the lumps we've tried to use the minimum amount of explosives stop s stuff flying everywhere we've got a section there which we'll have to pull with the machine but apart from that everything appears to be okay you have to stay here now we've got to go in and check this okay? from this distance no one is quite sure how much of the viaduct has come down and to what extent the stop arches have held the structure up but up close, it's apparent that the lumps are quite big. You're disappointed, but you, le you learn through things as well. So the, the, the extra bits that we were left was the trickiest bit. We knew they were the trickiest bits when we encountered problems, and Mark was away and he was away when we was charging up that we was encountering problems on them, you see. It's just the bad bits of the brickwork. It's um, it's not 100 percent as we we were hoping for, but uh, it's not a it's not a real problem. Looking at the inside of this brickwork now, the, the, this red, it's absorbed most of the you know 50 percent of the charge. But that's a stop arch. Over there is a stop arch, and by their very name, that's what they've done. They've stopped it. That's what they're designed to do. And uh, we just didn't get enough push on the, on the uh, this leg here. You disappointed? A little, yeah, yeah. It seems that the Victorians knew what they were doing when it comes to brickwork. But not everyone is disappointed. Very pleased, yeah, very happy. Yeah, uh, it's been uh, successful. Everything's gone to the second. We were 10 o'clock on the dot. Uh, everything's come down. It's uh, in pieces that we can manage. So yeah, happy, pleased. Ben Jarvis is one of the UK's most accomplished rocketeers. Based near London, his group, the Middlesex Advanced Rocketry Society, or MARS, already hold a host of records. Now, they're preparing to break the big one, the UK altitude record, which stands at over 4,300 metres. We've got uh, Richard, who's our simulations guy. Basically, he sort of does a lot of the design work and simulates, works out how high the rockets are going to go or not going to go. Steve's here, he's basically working on, uh, he mainly does a lot of the sort of construction work. We've also got uh, Chris, he's basically our sort of avionics and electronics guru. Marcus uh, runs an internet company, basically he's uh, in charge of hosting our website. Kath is uh, Marcus's girlfriend. Uh, Kath's basically just here, sort of helping us out with all the general tasks. Kevin's our sort of main audio-visual guy. And we've got our new recruits, Jim and Dave, who are also busy playing with lots of electronics. And finally, my name's Ben. I'm sort of in charge of making sure everyone does what they're meant to do. And I'm also in charge of the pyrotechnics, which is, well, basically all the sort of fiery bits that go bang. Amateur rocketry is one of the UK's fastest growing hobbies, and rocket enthusiasts take their sport seriously. With intense competition to push the boundaries further, rocketeers are now using serious amounts of high explosive power to propel their vehicles to the edges of space. When you, when you launch something that you can actually feel take off from half a mile away, that's uh, 
I think it's something, something about being able to sort of control something that's that powerful. When I was a kid, I was sort of uh, going to have been the kind of kid who would have uh, identified with Wiley Coyote rather than uh, Roadrunner. And I remember when I flew my first D-Class rocket, which at the time was sort of the biggest, biggest motor you can get in the model shops. Got all my friends around and we launched it and the thing worked and it was, you know, I was happy for a week. It's now got to the point where we've got to sort of uh, fly 20-foot rockets that um, have got 100 pounds of fuel on board in order to get the next bit of excitement. The Mars team have come together at a rocketry meeting in Lincolnshire. They're going to test their onboard video camera, crucial for gathering the evidence they'll need to validate their UK record attempt in a few weeks' time. Today, what we wanted to do was test the onboard video camera. What we got, we got a little tiny camera itself, plugged into a transmitter. Um, that transmits back to, we've got a big aerial, um, plugged into a receiver, which is plugged into VCR and the monitor. It basically acts as a good backup to the altimeters. If, you, if the altimeters don't work for whatever reason, if you can get images from, um, from the peak altitude, um, you, if you know how far apart things are on the ground, then it, basically you can calculate how high the rocket's gone from that. With Chris prepping the camera, it's Ben's job to load the rocket's motors. It's only a small flight today, but the solid fuel they use still provides a huge amount of explosive force, which means Ben is required to hold a Mode B detonator's license. You can be talking about fairly serious amounts of power. The, the motor we used to, um, to set the UK and European record last year in America delivered approximately a tonne of thrust for two seconds. And you could lift a person to about three or 4,000 feet with that amount of power. I guess, we, yeah, I guess when I was a kid, I was sort of the, uh, the kid who was always uh, trying to set fire to things and trying to, uh, <laughs> trying to see what, what you could make with your chemistry set that wasn't in the instructions. Like the bit that says, definitely do not ever mix a with C, and um, I wonder why. I'm just going to uh, take a couple of small rockets out to the launch pad and see if we can uh, fly them without losing them in this mist. So far today, the weather's been totally useless. It's, uh, we've had this fog. It got better for a little while, but it's just got worse again now. So uh, there's certainly no chance of flying any of the larger rockets or anything to very high altitudes. I'm, yeah, not, I'm not flying in this. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> As Marcus said, we can't fly it because the cloud level is below the height of the nose cone when it's standing on the pad. Oh my god, Darren's still going to fly Tintinik, he's mad. Why is he mad or why is he going to fly it? Five, four, three, two, one. I'm not launching my rocket. <laughs> Given Darren's flight only went to 500 feet and this is going to go almost twice as high, I've decided that it's probably not a good idea to fly it. Fog's just getting worse and worse, so uh, I think we're all going to uh, go back into the warm and retire to the uh, Indian restaurant very shortly. With the weather against them, the pressure is on for the Mars team. For veteran member Richard Osborne, the frustration is getting him hotter than the Vindaloo at the local Indian restaurant. If I get up in the morning ready, don't, don't yeah. try that. and there's cloud and there's fog, I'm going to set all the rockets on fire. <laughs> there better be blue sky tomorrow. But things are even worse in the morning. The snow and fog have made visibility so poor that there's a danger of hitting low-flying aircraft. And with strong winds too, the rocket could come down up to two miles away. With such a high risk of losing the rocket and its camera, the test flight is cooled off. But Richard is still determined to try out the recovery system, which the Mars team will be relying on to bring their rocket safely back down to Earth. I don't see why a bit of snow should stop me from launching a rocket. I don't think it stops the Russians, so I'm flying. It's, it's as simple as that, I am flying a rocket, because I want that whoosh. I want that adrenaline rush of just seeing the thing go up, because it's awesome. Excellent, two flashes. Yep, it's working. Right, Five, two, three, two, one. Oh! Well, it recovered. <laughs> oh! Whoa. Richard just has this, this reputation <laughs> of uh, <laughs> non-successful rocket flights. It's sort of a legend in the rocketry community that he comes up with wild and wonderful techniques of, of recovery and just sometimes they don't work. If it um, had blown the vehicle up, I'd have been a little bit peeved, um, but it certainly looks as if um, the rocket is in 
In reason, oh no, it's probably not in reasonable. Oh no, oh wow, wow. Obviously all the ice, it's pressurised inside and it's just, it's just exploded the tube. It wasn't quite what I was expecting, <laughs> but um, it was interesting nevertheless. And um, because of the way it worked, I was <laughs> slightly less than impressed that um, I've lost the rocket. But it was still, it was still sufficiently cool that um, I'll be building another one this week, that's for sure. The weekend's been a double failure for the Mars team. With no test for their video camera and a disastrous recovery attempt, Ben's decided to cut their losses. We really, really wanted to test the video camera um, this weekend before the um, UK altitude attempt in a few weeks. Failing that, we'll just have to um, launch it and see, <laughs> which is what we normally do, <laughs> and just keep our fingers crossed that it's going to work. It only takes an instant to launch a rocket, but to build a missile that will go from a standing start to Mach 2 in just a few seconds takes weeks of hard work at the research and development stage. We were here at my parents' house today in my dad's workshop, so uh, we're sort of uh, taking it over for the weekend to uh, try and get some of the work done on building the rocket. Basically today we're starting work on uh, actually building the booster for our altitude attempt. Basically sort of assembling it out of various bits of other rockets that we've built in the past. It's just a matter of sort of uh, cutting some bits up, working out some dimensions and making sure everything fits in there and putting it all together. Most, most parents say, oh, you use this place like a hotel, but you know, my, my parents say, oh, you use this place like a like Kennedy Space Center. But Ben's dad is no stranger to messing about with explosives. In fact, Ben is from a long line of top-notch boffins. I don't know whether it inspired Ben, but I made a very big mistake some years ago when he was young. I told him about blowing my mother's rose garden into the road. I mean, maybe he inherited it from in my genes, uh, who knows? Ben's hoping to make his mark with rockets, but his inventor dad has already made his lasting contribution to technological advancement. I came up with a few ideas, and one of them is the Rolf Harris stylophone. Start <laughs> technical hitch here. <laughs> Anyway, that is the stylophone. He may have blown up his own rocket at the test flight in Lincolnshire, but Richard has had plenty of adventures in space. He's the one member of the team who really is a rocket scientist. I started off um, working on a Russian Mars mission, um, which got to Mars orbit, and after two days, um, something went wrong. They lost the signal and never heard from it again. Then I got to work on um, an American Mars mission. It was just coming into Martian orbit. It just had to make the final um, burn, as they call it, to put it into orbit. They sent the signal and it blew up. I then thought, OK, I am not getting a good track record here. Everything I've worked on has been cancelled, has blown up or has disappeared in orbit around some other planet. So I thought, OK, well, I'm changing career and went into IT. But I'm going to work on it. And one day, you will see a rocket of mine come down safely on a parachute. Yeah, and, and monkeys might fly out of my butt. <laughs> <laughs> you wait, you wait, I will. <laughs> in the tight-knit world of rocketry, the Mars team's record attempt has been attracting attention from rival groups. Even in amateur rocketry, the need for secrecy is paramount. There's another group, um, a group called Southern England Rocket Flyers, um, and we've, we've heard that allegedly a couple of them are going to be trying to break the same record we're trying to break, which is the record for the highest altitude achieved in the UK. I take it at the moment we keep everything really quiet up until we launch. Do it the Russian way rather than <laughs> the American way. The pressure is on for Mars to get their rocket built, tested and ready for launch. But with their rocketry rivals hot on their heels, who will win the great British space race? Ben Jarvis and his group of rocketeers are preparing to enter the record books by surpassing the current UK altitude record. But they've heard that a rival group has got the same idea. It's a battle that may rely upon scientific proof, and the best proof of all is video footage taken from the peak altitude. 
So before their record attempt can go ahead, the Mars team have got to make sure that their onboard camera actually works. The primary aim is we're going to launch the video camera payload on as big a motor as we can possibly get away with. We've got about five hours of light left, so uh, we will see what we can get done. This is a camera payload. That's the camera itself. This is a transmitter wrapped in bubble wrap. And this is the first all up real test. Predicted to work quite well, but you know, you never know until you actually launch the thing. You mean not like you now, right now, transmitter. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to leave to it. Okay. Chris might have blown the transmitter up. Um, we hope he hasn't. We're going to bury him in a shallow grave in the middle of the field if he has. Hello. While Chris tries to get the camera working, Richard takes advantage of the perfect flying conditions to show the others that he can be trusted with bringing their rocket and the proof it carries back home in one piece. Five, four, three, two, one, ignition. Please, please, please. Yes. Yes! yes! <laughs> it stayed in one piece. Finally, I get a recovery system to work. Oh, I can't get over this. One piece. And Richard's success isn't the only good news. I managed to um, short a couple of the wires. I had some real troubles with the wires sitting in front of the lenses. Um, so it was all sort of a bit crushed up. So I've cleaned it all out and insulated some extra bits and. It's all fine now. The Mars team must test their onboard video camera today. But the light is fading fast, and as Richard and Ben prep the test rocket, which will take the camera to over 600 metres, there's a new problem. Oh, I've just done a bad thing. No, no, don't, 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 don't. Shut up. If this goes bang, I'm going to be really unimpressed. <coughs> the rocket carries two explosive charges, which deploy its parachutes, and Richard has armed them too early. The charges are motion sensitive, any sudden movement and they could explode. The rocket has become a potentially lethal weapon. Seriously, be careful of these charges, guys. Look out, Rich, move your finger. It's OK, your finger's the nearest, Rich. Don't wave it around. One G for one second and those charges will start firing. It's a dangerous situation and Chris's expertise is needed to disarm the charges before they blow up in someone's hands. Right, yeah. stand back, everyone. It's supposed to be an earth shattering <laughs> I'll get it on the right way around. And we're going to live. <laughs> very, very carefully put it together. OK. The explosive charges have been made safe. The launch can go ahead. But the light has nearly gone, leaving the team with time for just one shot at their all-important test flight. Five, four, three, two, one. Footage is perfect. <laughs> Absolutely fantastic. Couldn't ask for more for today. A perfect end to the day. Absolutely perfect. Mission accomplished. The camera has passed its test with flying colours. It's all systems go for the Mars team who can now move on to the final stages of preparation for the big launch. But there's still the competition to worry about. Across the country in Kent, Mars rivals the Southern England rocket flyers are catching up fast. Five, or are four, they? Three, two, one, fire. No, nothing. <laughs> three, two, one. Oh, Michael. What have you done with that one then? And here we go. Five, four, three, two, one. <laughs> That's really amazing. The only quick trouble is I can't get my head up quick enough to see where it goes. Right, a long walk now to go and fetch it. So I'll see you folks another day. <laughs> bye bye. Launching, five, four, three, two, one. Oh dear. It's launch weekend at last. 
With the weather looking good for the big day tomorrow, the team has come together to begin the task of assembling the rocket that they hope will thrust them into the record books. Right, um, well, it's allegedly launch weekend, um, so we're actually getting the rocket ready now. Um, this is the first stage booster. The huge scary motor goes in that bit. And this section will basically mate onto the top of the motor. This is the recovery bay for the booster, basically. There's a small parachute in here and an altimeter in here. On top of that, this is the second stage motor. Basically, that's just gonna be a loose slide fit into there. Um, sitting on top of that is, there's a little short piece of tube which has got a little tiny streamer in it. This is the electronics bay, which has got the video cameras and the altimeters in. Then we've got the main parachute bay for the sustainer, which basically fits on there. To top it all off. We've got Jim's very nice, sharp, shiny aluminium nose cone. We've still got quite a lot to do, so it's going to be a late night getting stuff ready, but um, I'm fairly confident we'll still get it ready for tomorrow morning. The Mars team have identified an ideal launch site, 50 square kilometers of isolated farmland. But with the rocket capable of achieving 8,000 meters altitude, there is a potential danger to aircraft. Air traffic control and the local RAF radar station have given them a short launch window, leaving the team limited time to get their rockets set up and airborne. From the moment you press the button, that's it. It's uh, in the hands of the rocket gods. Everything you've done for the last three or four months has to have been right. We just uh, pray that we did it, did do it all right. But there is already a problem. The transmitter from Chris's video camera is not working. To fix it would mean taking the rocket apart again and risking missing the launch window. <laughs> it's a major change of plan. Um, basically, the video has just died again, and our launch window is is running out. So basically we've made the decision that we're going to ditch the video on this flight. I'm not very happy at all, but I still want to love the thing. You know, to me, video is secondary. I want big smoke and flames. Right, is everyone ready? Okay, armed. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Launch all Z. Oh, oh no! The sustainer's come off. Right, heads up. Okay, that big metal thing you saw is now heading towards us at probably about three or four hundred miles an hour. Do we have still have track on anything? Two trackers. Are still beeping. The the booster um, went up uh, perfectly. There, there didn't seem to be any problem as that rocketed straight up. You could see the second stage light, and it just started to corkscrew and spiral upwards. Um, and the implication there is that it's the second stage. Something went very, very wrong on the second stage. The launch has been a disaster, but for the Mars team, it's vital that they recover the rocket. Not only is there expensive equipment to salvage, but they also need to get their hands on the data that will tell them exactly what went wrong. Straight towards those trees, I think. Helped by radio tracking equipment, which picks up signals from the rocket's broken body, the search is on for the missing pieces of the Mars mission. Very, very sensitive to like landing point for the sea. It's there, look, you can see it. Well, some of it is. Got a shovel. When you push the boundaries, there's always the chance of something going wrong. Simple as that, basically. So uh, you always learn more from a failure than from a success. 
it's, it's frustrating, annoying. But um, on our road to the final frontier, it's never going to be easy, but uh, <laughs> we're still going there. <laughs> Just because it's it's not it, it's hard doesn't mean we're not going to keep going. I want a sandwich. I'm starving, absolutely starving. <laughs> we have to walk back through the field. Oh, what are you going to do? Fly over it? But I'm just hungry. The Mars rocket only managed to reach 900 meters before it blew up but the team are already working on their next altitude attempt. And as for the competition? A bit of continuity. Well, they still have some way to go. Five, four, mm, sorry about that. I'm one of these freaks. I, I love fire. It's like hypnosis to me. I can withstand heat, but I have a respect for it. I've got great respect for it. Nick Alder is one of the world's leading special effects technicians. From early Hammer Horrors to big box office hits like Alien and The Fifth Element, his work has brought him Oscars, BAFTAs, and a reputation as the man to call when you need your movie to go with a bang. I'm very lucky I've got a good team with me. Dominic Chewy, Jeff Clifford, got Kevin Hurd, and I've got young Garth Guttridge and myself, who's Nick Alder, special effects supervisor. Nick is on location in Prague, where he's in charge of the pyrotechnics on Blade 2, a big budget Hollywood action thriller starring Wesley Snipes as a vampire hunting superhero. The film's big opening action sequence is an explosive set piece involving a huge firefight in a nightclub. This is called the um, House of Pain, this is the ballroom. Uh, and this is where a disco's going on, this is where all the vampires are, and a very large fight ensues in here. And this is where the guns come out, and this is where we start this very large shoot-up in this whole place. We've already done this whole sequence once before, um, and now we're down to like a 12-hour turnaround to get all this stuff put back together and give us all a second chance. But the second chance may be the only chance. If the director wants to make changes after seeing the rushes from last night, then the first take will end up on the cutting room floor. I think um, we're one of the departments that um, are, are constantly under pressure because um, of the nature of what we do. Unlike every other department that have several goes at it, uh, the camera, if it doesn't move in the correct way or the focus doesn't, isn't quite right, then they go again. If the actors mess their line up or don't hit their marks properly, then they have another go. And um, I think special effects is unique in that, in that respect, that um, we do only have one go at it. Um, this, is, this is unique because it's, it's a larger production with much more money, so they've already budgeted and allowed in their, in their schedule to do, to do this twice. But big budgets also mean high pressure. It costs a million dollars a week to keep this $60 million movie ticking over. If this scene doesn't work, it's a cool $200,000 down the drain. For someone like Nick Alder, who's, um, who's supervising it, the pressure is, is there even more because he'll, he'll go home every night and he'll be thinking about it and he'll be, be churning in his brain. And um, so I don't think the pressure is on, is on the rest of the crew probably as much. In film effects, bullet hits are created by special detonators called squibs, and this scene calls for an unusually large amount. When the guns come out, the set will be ripped to pieces by almost 500 mini explosions, each one of which has to be carefully prepared and concealed in the set. What we have, we've taken off air fiberglass mold, we've made air fiberglass, and we've actually pre-modeled the damage into them. We filled them, dried it all out, and then we've got the implants that we put in. Um, We've actually got all these pieces that fit like a jigsaw puzzle into these holes. We have got all their sections that are made like this. 
which we then drill a small hole, insert a small detonator, then we screwed back in position, and hence it will look like everything else. The squibs may be small, but each one packs a serious punch. Nick has to ensure that the explosions are not only effective, but safe for the hundreds of extras, cast and crew who will be in the middle of a virtual war zone. We're not doing demolition, but we are using just as dangerous explosives. We're doing it very visually, and it's like everything. They will all bite and they will all kill if you don't handle them right. That floor, for example, if somebody fell on the floor um, and I fired one of those off, I'd be serious, he would be in a bad way. I mean, if you put your foot on it, it would blow your foot off. They are like, literally, they are like landmines going off. They are really vicious. This little character is the one that's in the wall, and that's the one that's actually blowing all the dust and stuff out one, from there. Two, these basically are the charges that we're actually using in the balsa floor. And on the balsa floor, you've actually got two of those. You see, that's ripped a hole right the way through that wood, and it's completely split it all the way down. And you've got shards that are flying off out like this big. So you imagine the force. So if that little fellow was in your hand or something like that, you'd be certainly missing fingers. The use of so many of these potentially lethal detonators in one scene makes this the biggest shootout that Nick's ever done. But for Blade 2's writer and executive producer David Goyer, there is a reason for the scene's somewhat excessive force. Well, in the first film, Blade, uh, he hunts vampires. He hates vampires more than anything in the world. And I decided that the natural progression for a second film would be to, if Blade hates vampires more than anything in the world, then we needed to come up with a story where he was forced to team up with them. So we needed to find something that was fearsome enough to make even the vampires frightened. So that's how we came up with the idea of the vampire's vampire, or the super vampire, the, the reaper. The whole notion behind it, the, the, the sequence, is the vampires, it's the first time they've come in contact with the reapers. And so they've prepared all these weapons that you would normally use to kill a vampire with. And they're not effective. That's the, the point of this scene. So we needed, with the physical effects, to, to do something where we had overkill. You know, we're, we're literally, we chew up entire walls and, and the reapers keep coming and coming and coming and coming and coming. And the reason we had to do overkill is this is a scene that, that shows the vampires just how formidable these monsters are. There's nothing apparently can stop them. You would never normally have 30, 40 body hits all over somebody. I mean, the whole trunk of him is shot to pieces. You know, normally one, two, three probably would be like, would be normal, but this is like well over the top. He's one of these reapers that doesn't get killed. It's like a Tom and Jerry almost, you know, he's poor cat gets something done to him and he gets up and he's back to normal again. With so many hits in one scene, preparing the set has taken weeks. But for the retake on Monday, Nick only has a day to get all the charges laid, wired in and ready to go. I'm off, Jeff. I'm off like a rabbit. You know what I mean when I said it's very glamorous, this industry. I seriously don't know what I would be doing if I wasn't doing this. Maybe I would have gone in a strange way. I could have gone into a military background. Um, it was basically you're doing the same thing, but you're using live ammunition, I mean. <laughs> At least we're doing it for make-believe. Nick and his teammate Jeff Clifford are six weeks into a three-month shoot. It's a long time to be away from home, but having worked together for 35 years, Nick and Jeff have already lasted longer than most marriages. When we're, we're up against it, working hard, we gotta, I've got to work, it's got to be done. And at the end of the day, you say, come on, mate, we've done a good day, it, it's worked well, and that's all you need, really. That's not bad, Tom. We've just done our last one under there. Kevin's doing the last one up underneath there. We'll go home. I know I shall go back to the hotel and I shall go straight to the bar and have two very large ones before I get a shower. For Nick and Jeff, spending months away from home on location is second nature. Even the little time they do have off is spent talking shop. Well, how can I put it? Nick hasn't got no hobbies. His life is filled. We've got in at two o'clock in the morning. I'm sitting at three, four o'clock in the morning, and he's saying, tomorrow, we've got to get this right. 
and I think sometimes, what am I doing with him? He's, he's driving me crazy. Uh, 25 stunt people, one artist running through the middle of it, two main artists firing guns in it. You've got the camera crews in the middle of a whole lot. What we're doing and what you're seeing now, I promise you, is a damn sight more difficult than blowing a car up or blowing a building up. It really is. There's a lot of basic explosives in front of that poor guy. They are all capable of blowing that glass to pieces, blowing that ashtray, blowing that phone to pieces. Every one of them. It's Sunday, the crew's only day off, but Nick is always on call. The director and producer have seen the rushes from Friday night's first take and have decided that the colour of the blood needs to be changed for the scene to work effectively. No okay, boss, bye. The colour of the amber blood that we're using, it's, uh, it's kind of very translucent. I mean, against a black object, it's not showing quite as, as strongly as we'd like it to. And I think now that people actually really want to see that, if somebody gets hit now, they don't go, ouch. There are times when it's not necessary. Uh, but other times, yes, it is. And on, on this kind of movie, yes, it is necessary to see something because it's helping to tell that this, this guy, these reapers, you cannot destroy. So it's no good them going, ouch, you really want to see. He's got this big hole blown in him, and yet he still gets up and runs around. The pressure is on for Nick to get the changes ready for tomorrow when the big action sequence is scheduled. On a production this size, any delay can be prohibitively expensive. Because of the budgets, are that much higher then the pressure from basically every every kind of department and every kind of area becomes greater if the unit are held up for 15 minutes that can be a very large sum of money so that's part of the pressure that's on like literally every department you know um, budgets obviously have got an awful lot to do with it I mean, years ago we would go away and do a film with like two suitcases i mean we used to work with mouse traps through doors and knocking little bits of dowel out with dust. We didn't have any of these like bullet hits that we have today. Milk that blood up, which will make it show up more, uh, and also put some of the rubber bits into it. So we'll actually see like fleshy pieces that have come away from it. Then you'll actually be very, very big. It's strange the things that you think about walking down the streets. That's, that's, that's a really weird one. If people are actually walking towards you realises that you're actually thinking of how you were actually going to shoot somebody tomorrow morning. If only you had your thoughts, you'd be arrested. It's one of these buildings, when you look at it, you suddenly think, imagine blowing every one of those panes of glass out. It would be really kind of nice. I can imagine just going shattering all through this glass. I mean, it'd be quite, it'd be good, quite good fun. It's the big day. Nick has already been asked to make the blood more opaque, but all morning there have been more phone calls requesting even more changes. Today was going to be the day where we were actually going to shoot this, but there's been a change of wardrobe, there's been a change in makeup on the Reapers. So we're, we're going to actually do this tomorrow now. Sometimes you do something like this and it never even sees the light of day, it's gone on the cutting room floor. It's one of those things, or they say, it's in the director's cut. That's the classic, it's in the director's cut, so you've got to try and find the director's cut three or four years later. To make the overkill on the Reaper even more visual, the director has decided to add bare chest shots and exit wounds to the scene. But with time running out, Nick has to improvise to find the necessary ingredients. I'm going to shoot the Reaper in a different way. He's going to get shot three times with a shotgun. A big shot wound in the shoulder, entrance wound, exit wound on both shoulders, and he also takes one in the stomach and one of his back. The difficult part is now we're using our bare chest. That's why we're checking and finding different materials that we can put in there. Food colourings, uh, various thickening, kiddies drinks and kiddies puddings, and that to uh, just come up with a different reaper blood. But can explosions using food colouring and kids drinks really be big enough to satisfy the director of a $60 million movie? Top special effects man Nick Alder is on location in Prague, where he's in charge of the explosives on Hollywood action thriller Blade II. The film's big action sequence is being shot tomorrow, but first Nick and the team have got some last minute changes, requiring some unorthodox techniques. When you get problems like we've just come up with, we, we try er anything to try and get what they're asking for, you know? You know we, so we're coming up trying to make a mix that is thicker so that uh, when, it do, when it does go, 
you see it go, come through the air with bits in it, you know, you bits, bits of... of flesh yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I'll tell Nick to get more peach melbury, yeah? Yeah. And uh, this is what we're trying to do. As far as I know, the, the stuff we shot Friday, they're not using any of it, and, and they're going to uh, just use this one, the one they're going to shoot tomorrow, as the one, because they've changed the costumes on it. That's as far as I know. If it doesn't work tomorrow, that we've spoiled the shot. It, it has to work. We have between now and tomorrow to make this work. This industry is full of full of experts, um, even from all the other departments. Everyone thinks that um, like, all, all you've got to do is uh, do a bullet hit on someone's chest. That's all you've got to do. It's not quite as easy as that. Anybody can say. Oh yeah, they, I mean they've just blown up that building. Yeah, 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 it's kind of like, oh yeah, they've blown up that building. And that's, we're on the we're on the next one now. You know what I mean? Now we're gonna, you know, just make it rain. On one, three, two. And that's nice because that's happened a real big lump. And if we see that from the front, which has been much more visual now. Well, no. For director Guillermo del Toro, the changes are crucial for his vision of the scene to work. They may be last minute, but he's confident that Nick will come through. What I feel uh, with Nick that I truly find unique is that uh, I can relax uh, a lot more with Nick than, than, uh, than I have in the past with special effects, in the sense that he has a very good control of what he's doing. He unlike many other special effects guys, doesn't oversell. And you have a huge explosion that kills uh, 20 chickens uh, in a chicken coop nearby. It's like, you know, this is, a, this is a guy that knows his job, and uh, every time he has promised something, he has delivered. We're shooting around over 200 rounds, over 200 bullets on an individual, and uh, the guy keeps going. So essentially, it's a comic book moment. The whole point of the scene is that when you're a monster, life is unfair. <laughs> We're all kids, we've never grown up. It's just their toys have got bigger. Um, we get real planes, real trains, and their fireworks are bigger. But basically, we're still children at heart, I suppose. Bang, boys. Find the horn. With the film now behind schedule, the pressure is on for Nick and the team to get everything ready to go tomorrow. For Peter Frankfurt, the producer, getting this scene right is crucial. Welcome to the world of making big, complicated, uh, effects-driven movies. The effects are critical. The first movie was really, I thought, very successful on the whole, but I thought many of the effects sucked. And one of our primary goals in this one is to uh, outdo them exponentially, to shoot a big, uh, physical effects sequence that also involves digital effects takes a lot of preparation, a lot of, uh, of rehearsal, so that everything goes off properly. Because even though we can fix the digital effects in post-production, if the physical effects don't work on camera, then we're screwed. And it's a big, lengthy reset to, to have to do them again. It's 11 o'clock at night. What happened today? Lots of things got changed, so... Uh... It's the end of, not the end of another day yet, but we're getting stuff prepared, ready. Um, and I say, we're all prepared, ready to go again tomorrow morning. What more can I say? Apart from wash this space and hopefully there's no more changes. We haven't got a lot of time. Um, no, we're gonna definitely You've heard them, we're going to do the opening shot, the first Reaper being shot, which we're all prepared for, so he's in prosthetics at the moment. Uh, Dave does my manicure every morning. The lovely day. <laughs> oh, I just want to do this scene, man. It feels like forever we've been waiting to do this scene. This is my second time round. They, they blew the hell out of me on Friday. And uh, what is quite weird is that you, you, know, you rehearse it a few times and in your head you're imagining you know, pulling yourself back.
but when these these babies go off, you know, it's it's partly the force. There is force, but it's still the shock of it. You know, your whole stomach's going off, and it's uh, yeah, it's it's like really bad wind on the outside. <laughs> you can't get it wrong, you know. Please God, don't let me get it wrong. No, you've got to get it. You know, it's uh, there's a lot of people watching. A lot of people have put a lot of hard work in for that. 10 seconds, you know, 15 seconds of film. And there's seven cameras shooting it. And uh, it's, it's got to be right. It's got to be right. So, and I'm not a stuntman, you know, I've never done this before. I'm just an actor. Yeah, it's all looking pretty good. We're on to our last few connections. Nick's just going to do the final lock in, and then we uh, wait to go for it. One shot, man. One shot. That's it. 150,000 bucks a shot. You don't want to mess that up, you know? Basically, when the moment that, that camera is turning, you're immediately, everything else is completely switched off. You don't hear anything else. You don't hear that gunfire. You're physically just watching. It's kind of strange when you're in this rehearse, 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 and change this and change that, and you're ready to do it. But because you're kind of holding this delay up, you're becoming more and more nervous. You just want to say, gee them up and say, come on, let's go, let's go, let's go. It becomes an annoyance because you're getting held up, held up, held up. Really what you can do is just get it over with. Terrible lunch. <laughs> yeah, it was good. I mean, it was um, it was really scary, you know, because Guillermo said I'd be fired if I didn't get it right. Oh man, was, everything was going through my mind. Staying alive was quite important, you know, for me, because you can't see. I've got these lenses. I can't. I cannot see. So everything. I have to pace everything out. I have to know exactly how many steps. I have to go by light and shadows, and yeah, it's scary. But no, I mean, yeah, it was great. It was the, it's a fantastic sensation. Everything's going off, you're going off. You know, this, you're just being propelled back. And just the excitement. Old effects guys, they don't retire. They don't die, they just go out with a big bang and that's it. The 69th Battalion are an air show act with a difference, combining vintage aircraft, veteran combat pilots, 
and a great deal of high explosives, the 69th provide explosive entertainment at air shows across the United States. My name is Robert Heckendorf. I'm the team leader for the 69th Battalion Special Operations Group. Uh, we're an air show act that recreates an event that happened in South Vietnam in 1967. The really crazy bunch, the group we call the infield, they're the ones that are our own personal detonators that blow all this stuff up. Ron Krenzel, Tom Carney, Jim Berriman, Roger Crawford, Tom Burles, and of course my son Fielding. And the pilots, the ramp rats, all of us that just sit around here and fly airplanes and have fun. Ed Huber, Jerry Finch, Ray Lalo, Brown Cabell, Drew Chaitia, and myself, Robert, I'm, uh, I guess I'm kind of the, the head of this motley crew. The show gets real explosive when the pilots and the infield get together. What we have is explosive entertainment. We can't drop real bombs from the airplanes. Uh, let me correct that. We can drop real bombs from the airplanes. All these airplanes are combat veterans, and they are configured uh, to drop bombs. We are prohibited from doing that by uh, federal law. Uh, and common sense. Uh, we're, not, we're not trying to do damage to anybody. What we're trying to do is recreate an effect so it looks almost exactly like bombs are coming from the airplane and impacting. But it's all done uh, by a lot of science, a lot of work, and a tremendous amount of art and a little bit of magic. America's annual Memorial Day weekend is approaching. It's an important occasion for the battalion who dedicate their show to the veterans of the Vietnam War. And the team are preparing to perform at a big air show in Columbia, Missouri. First stop is the magazine where the battalion store their explosives. We have a few days to go until this uh, air show that's coming up in Columbia. And so we delay bringing the ordinance till the very last moment. And we transport it in uh, uh, approved magazines. In order to create the bomb hits, machine gun fire, and napalm explosions at the center of their show, the team require over 500 kilos of high explosives, which will be transported to the airfield on their own planes. Hello? Hi, J. Dobbs, are you at the ranch? OK, we're going to be out of here. We're just at Buckley now. We're heading to the airport. Uh, we should be at the ranch by 3 o'clock. We'll uh, fly down the runway, we'll buzz it, and then you can come out and move the cattle. But before the team go to Missouri, they've got some testing to do. Half an hour by air from their base in Denver, Colorado, is Robert's Ranch, remote farmland ideal for experimenting with explosives. We never, ever do a performance, either for the movies or for an air show, unless we practice it, practice it, and practice it. Because that's not the place to uh, <laughs> be saying, golly, I wonder if this is going to work or not. This is always the fun part, is when you're, when you're testing stuff. Joining Robert at the ranch are J.W. and Roger, two of the detonators from the infield team. The show recreates strafing runs, simulating airplane machine gun fire raking the ground. And today, the team are testing new TNT charges, which will boost each explosion higher into the air. Uh, this is a new kind of booster that we haven't used before, so it's basically a test to make sure they're going to do what we want them to do. OK, box hot. Box hot. Box the team also use explosives to ignite boxes filled with gasoline, creating the fireball effect of bombs and napalm. The gasoline vaporizes best in dry, warm conditions, but wet and cold weather is expected in Missouri. Here we are at 10,000 feet, and it's very cold. It's in the mid-40s. The wind's blowing like crazy. Uh, the explosives usually don't react as well in cold weather. So this is going to be a very interesting experiment to see if we're able to get the vaporization to make the type of fireball we want. Four, Fire in a hole. three, two, one. Box cold. Now this is interesting. You notice how the gas, instead of rolling up, stayed low. That's exactly why we we're concerned about we didn't get the boost because of the cold temperatures. Robert is going to have to hope for better weather in Missouri for his napalm simulation to be as realistic as possible. And if anyone knows what the real thing looks like, he does. 
As an ex-government agent who trained pilots for secret operations, he's got the ideal background for combining planes and explosives. I was a contract instructor for the military. I trained uh, pilots for a while. I also flew for a government agency outside of Langley, Virginia, and uh, got some explosives training there. And always loved to fly, and uh, had uh, always gone to air shows, enjoyed them. And, People had asked me to do special effects at the air shows. And that's when a group of us said, you know, if we're going to do this sort of thing, we can make a real crowd-pleasing thing by flying our own airplanes. And so it was off and running. Robert's background also explains the message behind the 69th Battalion's air show. Entertaining as it is, it's also his way of paying tribute to comrades who died in Vietnam and other conflicts. The reason we do this is all of us have a number of friends on the wall in Washington, uh, the Vietnam Memorial. And it's just our way of saying, uh, don't forget, there were 57,000 young men and women that uh, never came home. And so that's what we're saying is for those unsung heroes, never forget. And uh, it gets a little emotional <laughs> to me because uh, I have a couple of close friends on that wall. This weekend's air show in Missouri is dedicated to the memory of combat veterans. But first the team have to get there and transporting six planes, 20 people, and 500 kilos of high explosives over a 1,000 kilometers by air is something of a military operation in itself. Columbia, Missouri, and the normally quiet regional airport is busy preparing to host the annual Memorial Day weekend air show. Arriving on location, Robert is met by air show organizer Mary Posner, Hello. one of the 69th's biggest fans. He's a hero. Oh, I'm no hero. Yes, you are. No. You're my hero. <laughs> <laughs> the rest of the team won't be here until tomorrow, but pilots Drew and Brown have already reported for duty. Like many of their teammates, the pair are combat veterans with plenty of experience of explosives, and not always entertaining ones. I was a, a combat pilot in Vietnam, and uh, at the ripe age of 20, I was introduced to a lot of uh, high explosive type uh, situations. I was flying the L-19, or as it was later designated, the O-1 bird dog in combat, and uh, that's what we used to adjust artillery and to direct helicopter airstrikes and uh, tactical airstrikes as well. One of my first strikes that I provided a uh, BDA or bomb damage assessment, uh, it was called in uh, on the wrong coordinates by about uh, a click or a kilometer. I noticed the contrails first and uh, up in the sky from the B-52s and then I noticed that the, the jungle was coming apart as it was approaching me and I got out of the way. I could, I could still feel the, uh, the concussion uh, as I was uh, getting out of the way of this thing. But it's a, it's a rather awesome event uh, when you see trees flying through the air from, from high explosives. It's fantastic. In retrospect, it was uh, a rather exciting time. Uh, not one that I'd probably want to repeat, but uh, wouldn't trade it for a million dollars. It's the day before the start of the airshow weekend, and the team are getting down to business preparing their planes for simulated combat. We're standing on the ramp here waiting for the rest of our team to arrive, uh, specifically the UV-18A, the de Havilland Twin Otter that'll come with our magazines filled with explosives, as well as the uh, OV-1D Mohawk. Hopefully they should arrive within the next 45 to 50 minutes, uh, weather permitting. But earlier today, we were servicing all the planes, getting everything ready to go because uh, as they say, tomorrow morning is going to be hats and horns. We'll be out here at 0600, and uh, from then on, it's non-stop until the show's over. Despite the worsening weather, the battalion's Otter aircraft has finally arrived. As well as a full complement of high explosives, it's also brought one of the team's chief detonators, Robert's eldest son, Fielding. Every red-blooded boy loves, loves explosives and firecrackers. I guess it must be in the genes because now Fielding is a professional blaster. He's a foreman for uh, 
one of the largest companies in the United States. On the ranch, we'd always have the explosive magazines, and there was one that had just a big footlocker that we kept full of firecrackers and skyrockets. And we'd allow the kids to go in there whenever they had friends. They'd go in, they'd take a handful of firecrackers and pop bottle rockets and go out and have fun. Well, I have a motto in life, and that is you can't have too much fun. All of the 69th Battalion's aircraft have arrived. The team is ready for action but the weather is showing no signs of improving. Will the show tomorrow be an explosive event or a damp squib? The 69th Battalion Special Operations Group are an air show act who combine high explosives with aerial acrobatics to create spectacular reenactments of real Vietnam battles. It's 6 a.m. on the day of their first show in Columbia, Missouri, and the explosives team are on their way to prep the site. For fielding, the son of team leader Robert Heckendorf, handling high explosives is a way of life. Pretty much break rock for a living, just basically mining, drilling, and blasting, but uh, this is just a different application. This was something I was kind of born into, was special effects and, I mean, blowing ditches on the ranch at home, and we found out we could finally kind of make a living at, at having fun. Ron Krenzel, head of the infield team, is also on his way out to the site. Columbia ground, 69th pyro. Well, it's a better day than I thought it was going to be. I was thinking we were going to have rain. And it's harder to get good explosions when you have a lot of water in the ground. It tends to just suck the energy out of the explosives. OK. The weather may have come good, but now time is against them. The battalion are giving two shows over the weekend, but for this first performance, the team have just three hours to turn two and a half thousand liters of gasoline and 250 kilos of high explosives into the strafing lines, bomb blasts, and napalm wall that make their show so spectacular. We need 124 boxes and 16 bombs today. This is a high explosive, it's very stable as opposed to black powder, fireworks, things like that. The highest detonation velocity is uh, almost 30,000 feet per second. You don't want to get in the way of that because you won't be around to tell anybody, so. Yuling! Coming over your head, Tom. Trying to get on your head. A lot of work for about uh, 15 seconds of boom. But putting on an explosive air show isn't all hard work. For the pilots, there's not much to do but wait for their moment of glory. Oh, the infield, yeah. Yeah, those guys work their ass off. They really do. Yeah. The pilots get all the glory, and we put on the show. <laughs> Any airplane can fly by. Here you go. We got 35 minutes, guys, so we really got to Hustle now. The 13th annual Salute to Veterans Parade. Our parade boss, Carl Miller, says this is going to be the best parade that we have ever had. We're very close to not making this. You got everything we yep. need? Yeah, let's get down in the infield, yeah. Right. No, we got enough bumps. The sunshine and temperatures finally warming back up to where they should be this time of the year. It's going to get a little toasty out here. The weather may have cleared up, but the soggy ground has delayed the deployment of the explosives. With just a few minutes left, the team have had to cut some corners. Time has run out. The planes are in the air for the battalion's first performance. Ready or not, it's showtime. Number five is rocket. Number six is napalm. You're down wind from us, aren't you? You can't feel that testosterone? <laughs> <laughs> okay. The show is going with a bang, but in the last minute rush, some of the firing lines have become mixed up. Who did that? <laughs> is that a strafe that way? 
damn it! The explosions have certainly gone off, but not quite in the right order. That happens sometimes. Anyway, we'll have that corrected tomorrow. In the 69th Battalion's air show, timing is everything. Today's show may have provided the crowd with explosive entertainment, but the infield team aren't happy with how it went. They're determined to get everything timed exactly right for their signature show tomorrow. when it absolutely, positively, has to be blown up. We call the 69th Battalion. Look at me! I'm on top of the world! The infield team are ready for action. And on the other side of the airfield, Robert and the pilots are ready for their climactic show, the recreation of a Vietnam War search and rescue mission. We will come in, shoot down and crash one of our airplanes, and we'll have strafing, bombing, napalm, uh, the parachute jumps and uh, rescue the downed pilot where the Viet Cong, North Vietnamese Army are attacking. And uh, the special forces assault team comes in, protects him, and kills all the bad guys. And we win again. I'm ready. For two of the Ramprats, this is an extra special show. It's Brown's first time in the starring role, usually taken by Drew, piloting the bird dog in its death-defying crash stunt. I can't tell you how excited I am. I really can't. Obviously, as you've seen so far, we've had a lot of fun. But when we get into that airplane, it's serious. And we, we do what has to be done to uh, provide a, a safe and impressive show. And that's what it's all about. Yeah. Hey, oh, serious. Here we are. Serious. It's very serious. <laughs> God bless America. The planes are in the air and the explosives are set and ready to go. The show kicks off with the bird dog's crash stunt and Brown is going for all-out realism on his big debut.
coming up. It's gonna come just over like at that. you, right? Just like this. Whoa! Right then. Tell you what, I came down, rounded out, and I said, I got this thing wired, man. I'm hooked. I don't think I can get out of this. Uh, I've not felt something like that in 30, 30 years now. We see the Sky Leader come down and the napalm go up, and you see all the, the fire and the black smoke against the green of the countryside. And it's just like being back in country again. And I mean, I touched down on that right main and all of a sudden it just went, Whoa. it's like you're in country, man. Yeah. It's like you're just, you know, you're coming down the beach off. Thank you. 